My name is Ron Buffington, and I'm the head of the art department here at UTC. Um, we're really happy to have you here uh, with us tonight as we prepare to kick off the seventh season of the Diane Merrick Visiting Artist Series uh, with a visit by the Brooklyn-based artist, Matthew Delegate. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free. Yeah, that, that sounds like excitement. I like that. Uh, tonight, Matthew will be lecturing on his work, uh, on his thought, his inspiration. Uh, after this, we will open his exhibition in the Crest Gallery. This is only a small part of Matthew's itinerary. Over the next few days, he will be meeting with members of the Chattanooga Arts community. He'll be making presentations on his process and approach to materials, as well as on the subject of professionalism. Uh, he will be touring the AIMS Center and meeting with program participants there. And he will be conducting studio visits with our upper division BFA studio majors. All of this is possible thanks to the hard work of our director and curator, Ruth Grover. <laughs> Not to mention Matthew himself, of course. Uh, the support of the Merrick family, I would like to also... and the vision of Diane Merrick. So, yeah. Thank you, thank you all. Um, each time we host a Diane Merrick visiting artist, I'm reminded of a comment made by one of our students during the first year of the series. Uh, after overhearing a thought-provoking lecture, as the gallery doors opened on a truly exceptional and memorable exhibition, this student, who was practically levitating, you know, from the force of the impact of this experience on her, said simply, this place is special. In that moment, she recognized the level of our aspirations, our collective aspirations as a department, and she set the bar for the foreseeable future. If the Department of Art has a private mission statement, one that's not necessarily published in a catalog, but which sort of quietly guides us, it is that this place is special. We all work towards the standard every day when we set foot on campus, student and staff and faculty alike. As you listen to Matthew's lecture tonight, as you ponder his exhibition afterwards, and perhaps even strike up a conversation with the artist, I believe you'll agree with this anonymous student who clarified for all within earshot precisely why we do what we do. More importantly, you will be participating in this mission. You will be helping us rise to the standard. So that's what's at stake tonight. Thank you all for being here. I'm really here just to introduce Ruth Grover, who is here to introduce the artist. So that said, have a great time tonight. Ruth, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you, Ron. Of course, this is, uh, this is Ron Buffington's first Merrick event as head of the Department of Art. So we're very happy, Ron, uh, for that. <clears throat> and also, of course, you know, um, this is a special place and a special series that really sets uh, UTC apart from other institutions. Uh, and it's a wonderful partnership uh, with the Merricks um, to uh, uh, be able to um, have the Diane Merrick Visiting Artist Series here at UTC. Uh, and of course, while they bring the artists here and pay for all those expenses, uh, the Crest Gallery brings the exhibition. That's a very special relationship that we can bring the artist here with the exhibition have the artists here for extended period of time to speak to the community, to the students, and to talk about the work um, so that we get a special perspective about um, the, uh, the artist's ar artistic output. Uh, so, but I'd like to in, in, encourage you to join in that partnership and become a friend of the gallery. Uh, so please consider that at some point. Um, also tonight we will have a checklist of the various um, 
pieces in the exhibition rather than putting labels up because the work um, especially involves the full space of the gallery. Uh, we have a checklist and that will be at the door so you can see the individual names of the pieces and the materials used. Um, and all of this work, by the way, uh, is, uh, uh, was created especially for the crest, the spaces of the crest. Um, and we're really happy to have Matthew here today. He's already begun his, uh, his duties as Diane Merrick visiting artist. Um, with um, three class meetings already before, before this lecture. Uh, and uh, um, he's um, <coughs> been really dynamic. And uh, I think you're really enjoying him tonight. A few biographical notes. Uh, Matthew is a native of Highland, Indiana, which is a suburb of Chicago. Um, he now resides in Brooklyn, New York. He holds a BA in art and German from Wabash College. Uh, an MFA in painting, and an MS in theory, criticism, and history of art and architecture from Pratt Institute, Brooklyn, New York. He's had additional study in Vienna, Austria, and Venice, Italy. Uh, he's co-founder of the gallery Minus Space in Brooklyn, New York, which serves as a platform for the promotion of reductive art, representing an international group of artists and organizing exhibitions of their work worldwide. Uh, Matthew writes and lectures on contemporary abstraction as a member of the American Abstract Artists, serving on the Artist Advisory Committee for the Marie Walsh Sharp Art Foundation and on the board of the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts. Uh, he's consulted with dozens of art organizations over the past decade, including the Joan Mitchell Foundation, Creative Capital Foundation, and others. Matthew, it's a great pleasure to bring you here tonight, and let's give him a round of Applause and welcome. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your interest. Uh, my name is Matthew Delegate. Um, I'm an artist, uh, first and foremost. I do uh, a lot of other things, like many artists do, um, often by default, because I see that they need to be done. So uh, in addition to wearing uh, my artist hat, I also um, uh, I'm a curator, I guess, by default. I run a gallery space in Brooklyn that I founded about 10 years ago. Um, I've worked in nonprofit. I worked at the New York Foundation for the Arts for about a dozen years um, during a very special time with that organization. Uh, for some reason, I've been brought on to the boards of a couple of different arts organizations in New York City um, and um, have been contributing there. And then I'm often kind of available to a number of other arts organizations where they um, kind of pick my brain a little bit. So I've worked with um, nonprofit exhibition spaces, some private artist foundations, some national service organizations. Um, I've done lots and lots and lots of work. It's sort of an unusual kind of portfolio of things. I often feel like I'm kind of the Forrest Gump of the art world. I'm kind of just around and things happen, uh, which is how I would describe my career at this point. Um, but uh, I'm here tonight to talk uh, a bit about my work. Now, I hate artist talks for the most part because they're always boring and I'm always leaving disappointed and I don't want to rattle off image after image after image after image and tell you the size and the media and the, the amount of paint that went into a painting. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more sort of strategically, like how my brain works a bit, how I approach my practice, um, which is ongoing um, and um, has gone through sort of lots of you know, different kinds of iterations uh, over, over time. Now, I'm not going to show you any of the work that's actually on view in the exhibition. I thought about showing it to you, and I thought maybe not, and then I thought, yeah, maybe, and I'll let it, um, I'll let you have a look at it. Uh, but I'll tell you kind of the ingredients that went into it, um, certainly. Now, uh, Ruth, thank you so much for inviting me here to be uh, the visiting artist. Um, Ruth, I mean, Dura deserves like, uh, an unbelievable amount of credit. Uh, sh many of you might have seen that text that she wrote, and I may have said this before. Did you see this, this sort of page-long text about my work? It's really well written, in, a, in addition to many other things, but it was based on, um, on faith. Uh, and it was written based on some ideas that I gave Ruth for work that I might potentially realize here on site. So she wrote a, you know, a 500, 600, maybe 800 word essay on a body of work that I had not yet made, okay? Which is really, I mean, really an, an act of faith um, and vision. So thank you for that. Uh, 
the exhibition um, that I decided to do for you guys, um, really in collaboration with your venue and your resources and the specifics of this community, is a show called Pictures at an Exhibition. And um, it is uh, a direct sort of quote of a piece of music by a Russian composer named Mussorgsky, who um, sort of a romantic composer, wrote a lot of different kind of stuff. Uh, but he was inspired by um, a painter friend of his after visiting his exhibition in Russia in the, I think it was probably the 1860s, 1870s, to write this piece of music. So there's a piece of music that was written based on a visual experience. Um, and I'm really interested in sort of abstractions, relationship to um, many, many different kinds of things, including things like music. And early on, 100 years ago, abstract artists really looked towards music as the model to move inch at a time into um, the possibility of doing uh, non-objective or non-representational work. Um, so music is a big theme in my work. Um, I live in New York City. I don't own a car. I've like never owned a car in my entire life, which may surprise like some of you guys because it's like so car culture. I've never been in a car as, as much as this week. Um, I listen to my iPod a lot. Uh, we go underground in subways and we ride buses and take taxis, and I do a lot of running, actually, where I listen to my iPod, and I've constantly got it on shuffle. So I've got this kind of constant DJ going through my head of all kinds of music that I'm interested in, not just sort of Russian music, but uh, punk rock music, The Clash, um, you know, hip hop. There's a lot of stuff that's um, sort of quoting and referencing these kinds of things in the show for you here. Um, I had my hands involved in organizing a show of Joseph Albers' work a few years ago at our space. Um, who, after uh, retiring from Yale in the late 50s, was suddenly given all these tremendous commissions. So he was doing architectural commissions. Um, he was doing fireplaces. He was doing graphic design. He was doing all sorts of things. So I organized an exhibition of his work um, that he had done. He had, um, in the late 1950s, designed a series of record covers for a new record label called Command Records. Um, and one of those records was pictures at an exhibition, which is this beautiful, iconic image. I won't show it to you because I don't want you to start making exact referencing um, for that. But thinking about music, thinking about abstraction, thinking about um, Joseph Albers, and sort of taking something that began as a visual thing into music, into abstraction, back into a visual thing. So I liked all of these kind of elements in choosing the title for the show. And you're going to see that titles are really important to me as a as a sort of a creator, they're, they're important for me in titling my work, in titling exhibitions, in titling exhibitions at our gallery. So titles for me are important. A lot of um, abstract artists like to call things untitled. Um, I'm not one of them. Title, um, language, literature, references are all critically important to me. Um, that said, I also like the fact that pictures at an exhibition seem very meta. They seem very sort of self-referential. Like you're going to be seeing pictures at an exhibition called pictures at an exhibition. So there's a bit of a loophole, which I think is an interesting entry point into like what my work is about. Um, so on view, you're going to see um, paintings. So I describe them as paintings. Um, I'm a painter. I've been trained as a painter. I've been painting my entire life, actually. My grandfather was a painter. I learned painting from him. He studied at the Art Institute of Chicago in the 1930s. Um, so I've been around painting for a very long time. Um, and I consider myself a painter, although I don't consider myself a romantic painter, where, um, like many of my colleagues, sort of labor a lot in the studio. They spend a long time making work, um, which is necessary to do the kind of work that they do. And I'm sure some of you might have heard me say this once already, so forgive me, since we have a different crowd, um, different audience here. Um, so yes, yeah, so I really um, look at painting. Now, painting is. Um, something that's been considered dead about 40 times already. Um, abstraction has been considered over and long gone a zillion times already. Um, the kind of work that I'm interested in, which is a very specific tenant of abstraction, which is geometric or reductive abstraction, has been considered you know, dead and over for ages. Um, and uh, I don't agree. Uh, I'm a painter. Um, I think that there's a ton of opportunity in painting. Uh, still, I mean, painting is the first thing that we did as a, as, a, as a species. I mean, there's been articles in the New York Times recently uh, about cave paintings that have been recently found. And 
the first cave paintings weren't of bison and woolly mammoths, but they were actually of abstraction. So uh, I don't know how many of you have an uneasy relationship with abstraction, or you are curious about what it is, or it's off-putting to you, but this is something that is as old as we are as a culture. Um, it's something we do uh, intuitively, consciously, subconsciously. It's been around for ages. Um, that said, you know, making marks is um, still valid, and using mud to do that is still a valid medium for me. Um, but I feel that, uh, and again, abstraction is only 100 years old in kind of the way we describe it now. So this is very, very, very young in kind of the, in kind of the time span of artistic practice. So 100 years, uh, that's it. I mean, my great-grandmother was alive for this. So, you know, this isn't a, a, a very long amount of time to consider something dead and over, right? Um, so that said, um, the kind of work that I'm, I'm doing right now is really um, based on um, sort of thinking uh, much more about sort of strategies. So where are there opportunities in, in, in painting? Where are there opportunities in abstraction? Where is there opportunity in uh, sort of geometric abstraction? Like what's still available? What's on the table? Like I see this glass as totally half full, not half empty. But um, is it still okay for me as an artist to sort of sit in the studio, and this is my painting brush, like hand gesture, sorry, I'll do this a zillion times. Is it, um, is it enough to make paintings and just sort of move paint around a canvas and make images? Uh, is that enough? Uh, I think it is for some people, it's just not enough for me. So the work that I've been doing has really kind of been, at least over the last 10 years, I've been backing further and further and further off of this kind of practice into something that's much more sort of in my head, um, starting with ideas that then get matched with materials, which may or may not be paint, okay? Um, I'm not romantic about painting. I don't make work that um, is made or destroyed with a brush stroke. Um, I tend to know when my works are finished. I ask, get asked that question, how do you know when this is finished? You know, like abstraction, so sort of a typical question. Um, I know when it's done because it's completed the cycle of what it's supposed to be. Um, so um, I'm going to show you some examples of some work uh, and just talk about some of the things that I'm thinking about. But I'm interested in kind of everything. Everything in terms of subject matter is on the table. Some things that have been preoccupying me for the last, say, few years, uh, certainly music, uh, certainly this idea of having kind of a random DJ shuffle feature on my iPod. Um, certainly um, things that are given as conventions within painting, like red, yellow, and blue. Um, this to me um, is a ready-made, and you guys are familiar with Marcel Duchamp and basically pulling stuff out of the context of, you know, real life and artifying it, right? So red, yellow, and blue is something that I didn't invent, and I like adopting things into the work and co-opting things in my work that I had nothing to do with. Um, so there's a lot of work on view in the, in the exhibition that's red, yellow, and blue. There's a lot of stuff there that is uh, black, white, and gray. Uh, again, so these are sort of artistic givens for me. Um, I didn't invent the idea of painting. I didn't invent the idea of a monochrome. I didn't invent pattern painting. Um, but I'm sort of taking all these things and sort of rehashing them. So uh, in addition to my iPod, I'm interested in things um, like uh, politics. Um, I'm interested in warfare. Uh, particularly like the Iraq and um, uh, Afghanistan war. I'm looking at sort of corporate culture. I'm looking at corporate greed. I'm looking at materialism and like mass consumption and warfare that's involved in defending the ability to consume on a massive scale. So I'm looking at a lot of different things. Um, there's sort of a different mashup in every conceivable kind of work that I do. So in some cases, it's much more lighthearted, and, so, and sometimes it's a little heavier. But I'm interested in asking questions and uh, looking at painting um, almost from kind of the molecular level up. Like literally, if I was able to tear painting apart, what would it look like from the very beginnings of what that definition means? OK. Um, so let me just dive in. Um, I never do slideshows, so I'm just going to dive into my website, which hopefully will load. Um, but if you guys have questions, just raise your hand, offer comments. Um, I don't want to be lecturing at you. I would much more have this be um, sort of an interactive conversation um, than anything else, uh, which I feel 
art is the trigger for, art is the catalyst for that. Um, so um, again, you're going to see sort of on this first page, these are all sort of projects, and I tend to work project by project. Um, I tend to make work that's sort of site sensitive or site specific. Sometimes um, I've been handing over the control of the art making practice altogether to other people, which is I think is an interesting kind of question within painting itself. Does it even matter that I make it anymore? Um, can other people make it for me? Do they need to follow my instructions at all? Can they invent their own instructions to sort of realize pieces? So um, what you're seeing up here is sort of a big mashup uh, of sorts of different strategies. Um, one strategy that you're going to see on view in the gallery, and it's not this piece, but it's a piece uh, that I did a few years ago for a traveling show um, that went through Auckland and, uh, no, went through um, New Zealand and Australia, is a piece called Known and Unknown Knowns and Unknowns um, from 2010. Now, um, what you're seeing here are six wooden panels. Uh, they've all been painted um, meticulously well with fluorescent yellow paint. So I identify sort of fluorescence as being a um, very interesting kind of color um, in that it references, um, it doesn't reference nature, it references everything artificial. Um, and I also see, um, I see it often in construction. So there's sort of an architectural kind of pragmatic use of the color. And I see it often in munitions. So like in, um, in bombs and in warfare, this is a color that's used quite a bit. So this is a piece um, that I did a few years ago. And you have three panels, or there's actually six panels in sets of three, three of which are broken with a hammer. So I make these meticulous paintings, and then I actually break them apart uh, with a hammer. Now, this is a piece that is um, titled and based on um, a quote by Donald Rumsfeld, um, former defense secretary. You guys, yeah? I know a lot of, yeah, OK, you see it on. OK, good. So Donald Rumsfeld, um, of course, was the, you know, the Secretary of Defense for years and years and years under Bush. And he, yes? Is it OK to boo? Boo. Oh, yeah. Boo. Thumbs up. I mean, again, what, what is, it's a really good question because um, I'm very cautious in this work, which tends to be political or somehow politically motivated or politically engaged, uh, not to editorialize. So this stuff is pretty open-ended. So you, and, I, and I want it that way. So if you want to boo, go for it. Um, what I found specifically interested, uh, interesting about him is that during the Iraq war, kind of, I don't know, two years into it, he gave that very famous speech where he talked about why things were going so badly on the ground, like why we weren't welcomed with open arms. And um, he gave something that was absolutely asinine but totally brilliant at the same time, which I like that contradiction, which was he talked about that there were uh, a lot of known knowns things we know we know, and then there were a lot of uh, known unknowns, sort of the things we know we don't know, and then there were the unknown unknowns, the things we didn't know we didn't know, right? And the things that we didn't know we didn't know was actually the root of the problem, right? So the unknown unknowns. And I like this sort of phrasing, I like the patterning of the language, I liked um, how it fit together, I felt it was a good structure to make a painting on. So again, we've got known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. Okay, I don't want to be so literal about it, but this is what I was thinking. So language coming out of sort of warfare, coming out of the Department of Defense, influencing what a monochrome painting could look like. Okay, and I've been obsessed with monochrome painting lately. Monochrome is like literally one color painting, for those of you guys that don't know it. It's kind of this thing that holds court in New York, very it's a, kind of like an end game kind of a thing. People are highly respective of monochrome painting, but totally suspicious of it. Uh, and I am too. So this is sort of a homage and a, and a subversion of that. So um, yeah, I kind of think about that language that Rumsfeld was talking about and um, in terms of sort of like the, the artistic practice. I mean, is this something that could apply to me? He's using it for one application. I'm using it for another. So you know, the things I know, I know in my studio. Uh, the things I know, I don't know. And as artists, we're constantly um, in the process of self-education. I mean, you guys are now in an educational institution where you are learning how to self-educate, right? You are learning how to learn. Um, at least that's what I'm seeing. Um, so as artists, we're constantly learning. Um, we're constantly reading, researching, bringing influences in. Um, and then there's the things I don't know I don't know, which is always the stuff that keeps me up at night. 
you know, which is the stuff like, oh my God, I wish I would have known about this artist who had done something comparable to what I was doing, like a stack of books in the gallery um, prior to my show, which also includes a stack of books in the gallery. So these kinds of things, the unknown unknowns. Um, so again, one strategy, um, broken panels. Um, this specifically came out of um, a work that I never really intended to make, which was um, this piece. It's a piece called Pink Nightmare. Uh, and it's a piece I made about five or six years ago at this point. Um, but it was uh, literally a bubblegum pink um, monochrome that was broken apart with a hammer. It looks exactly like this. It's very much matter of fact. So the Pink Nightmare here was um, you know, made at a period of time where I was seeing I think we were all seeing just images of warfare and warfare and warfare and warfare was on the front page of the Times. I read the Times a lot. I'm in New York um, every single day. And every single day there were images of destruction and suicide bombings and bombings and air drone strikes and all sorts of stuff. And um, you know, you rarely saw the, um, the explosion itself happening other than through sort of, you know, insurgent documentation, which is a whole other kind of form of communication. But uh, you often saw images of like marketplaces blown apart by, say, a suicide bomber. And you saw sort of the aftermath of how everything around those places was absolutely totally scarred, charred black, buildings collapsed, bodies everywhere. And um, for some odd reason, uh, you know, the Red Crescent would sort of swoop in to say a marketplace in Baghdad, uh, like they would do here. And they, you know, out of respect, cover the bodies. Um, and I don't know who the supplier was, but it clearly was probably Halliburton or somebody else. Um, and they would s cover the bodies with these bright pink blankets or bright sort of baby blue blankets. So you'd see this absolutely demolished landscape with these rectangles of color in them, which was just stunningly horrific and beautiful at the same time. So I started thinking about whether um, you know, a, a painting can be something beyond a spiritual experience. I mean, abstraction is constantly associated with spirituality or existential mark making or you know something else. And I really just asked the question of whether a painting could be a suicide bombing. I mean, can it look like that? Can it function in that way? Um, so this was the, uh, the pink nightmare. So this is sort of the, the beginning of that kind of a strategy. Um, similarly, um, so this is sort of an imploded piece. I'll show you um, an exploded piece. Um, say, I don't know, I'll show you these war monochromes. Um, so these were, um, again, another way of looking at painting. And there is an example of this in the show, although with a different strategy. That was that sort of uh, red, yellow, blue piece that you saw. So these were uh, a body, and again, I work um, very modularly and sort of very um, kind of um, self-referentially in some cases. So sometimes I'll make a piece and then I'll go and do something else then I'll refer back to a piece in another piece. So I constantly am sort of self-cannibalizing in a way. So um, again, this is a suite of monochromes. I think you can see them pretty well. That were uh, store-bought canvases, nothing special, literally out of a dollar store across the street from this venue in Sydney, Australia. I bought them out of sort of a, it's like a ch Chinese market. Um, hung them on the wall and then spray painted them on site. So with the intention of creating a perfectly evenly painted monochrome. So spray with a can of spray paint until the surface of the painting is completely green or completely silver or completely fluorescent orange. Again, all based on the color of warfare. These are warfare colors to me. Um, and then leaving them as is. So there's paint that is obviously splattered onto the wall, that's splattered all over the floor, it's everywhere. It's a real mess. Um, and I like this idea of um, moving away from being able to control the brush stroke. Everyone's interested in painting with the virtuosic brush stroke that no one else can copy. And I have been backing off of that quite a bit and trying to use tools that I cannot control whatsoever. Um, also very closely looking at like graffiti culture. I live in Brooklyn. I'm not a graffiti artist, but looking at like aesthetics of mark making that other people do, um, whether to tag a wall as a sort of a signifier, some sort of logo, some sort of image that travels through space and time on subway cars, right? Sort of durational performance piece. Um, 
but thinking about how graffiti artists would do this. They do it quickly, they do it sort of subversively, they do it at night, and they often call this process bombing. So they bomb a wall. And I like this idea of like, well, can painting be bombing? And this is sort of where this body of work came from. Um, every time I do this piece or pieces like it, they change. They change on the venue, they change in the context, they change in the context of the other artists that are in the exhibition, the size and the space. Um, this is actually a work that I had proposed to Ruth to do here without realizing that the walls were covered with um, this sort of fiberglass material. And it would have been impossible to get it out of that. So um, adapting this idea, I um, have a piece in the show which involves uh, the projection of light as an alternative to this. So creating a monochrome on site um, that is uh, done in sort of a site-specific way. Um, are there any questions about any of this? Just feel free to sort of throw your hands up. Uh, I'll show you another example. Some cases I didn't make the work at all, but I had other people make it for me. And um, again, communicating painting ideas to other people is a very interesting thing. So this was made by collaborators for a show at a university in Wellington, New Zealand, which is um, you know the capital of, of New Zealand. Uh, and they interpreted the work slightly differently. So, and I'm, I'm okay with that. Again, painting in this manner as, um, as another strategy. There is a painting that's in the show as well that is a sort of a hybrid of those broken panels and a spray paint. So um, things I've been thinking about specifically for this show is um, the fact that, you know, graffiti tagging is never done in a geometric way. You know, it's like this seems like a no-brainer. You've all seen sort of like squiggly, very cursive sort of style of graffiti. Uh, but no one does the kind of hard edge graffiti, which is the kind of painting that I'm interested in. So I wanted to see if I could make a hard edge painting with graffiti, um, which is on view. So you'll see a black and white stripe painting um, that's on view in the show. Uh, I'll give you another example of some ways of working. Um, this is a piece that um, is in a slightly different iteration than um, what you're seeing right now. But this is a piece called uh, Overlord. Uh, American Dream, and um, it is exactly what you think it is. It's a black garbage bag. Um, it is uh, 30 gallons. It's uh, extruded black polymer plastic, and I do a lot of painting with acrylic paint, and I'm interested in monochromes and sort of things that involve abstract painting, um, including grids and surface and patterns. Um, and I often paint with acrylic paint, which is basically pigmented plastic. So, you know, if I could paint with, say, a Mars black, it's pretty much the exact same material as this, which is pigmented polymer plastic. So I thought, well, why bother painting it when I can just obtain it, like use it in a slightly different way? So um, this was a piece um, that I did about six years ago that's another kind of strategy that is literally a black garbage bag. I think it's a hefty bag um, that I turned upside down, unfolded, and pinned to the wall. Um, and again, it's a direct reference to images of body bags that I've seen and sort of the war for consumption, the war to defend American interests overseas. And like, why are we killing people for the consumption of things? And we're in a consumer society where we dump stuff out. So this was like the most um, particular material I could have found to um, sort of represent culture um, about mass consumption. Um, Again, this is, a, this is an object that's meant to be thrown away. I mean, this is an object that's manufactured to in, in sort of like encase garbage and get rid of it. So it's like about as lowly an object as you could possibly get, um, right? So again, a black garbage bag. So there's a piece that relates to this in the space. Um, also with the same material, slightly different context called nuclear error. Um, it is uh, a huge grid of these that is attached to the wall with static electricity. And again, thinking of um, lyrics from The Clash, London Calling, Nuclear Era, and thinking about um, the tsunami in Japan where there's seas of garbage flying everywhere and the meltdown of nuclear power plants. Um, I think it's, it's appropriate. So you'll see that one in a bit. Uh, yeah? Questions about um, the Sure.
It's a good question. It was solely an aesthetic decision. Um, three of the works that I made for um, this show specifically, which I've never done before, that I realized specifically for this exhibition, were made on site. And they involve the wall directly. So rather than having like large labels up to sort of um, provide um, sort of contextual labeling information, it became distracting. So we decided to have a handout instead. It wasn't anything more than that. Um, it was solely aesthetic. Um, I like uh, shows that are completely underhung um, with as little information as humanly possible, um, where every element in that show is incredibly sort of choreographed. I don't want to say theatrical, but heavily, heavily edited. Um, so the labels became one more visual element, um, and we decided to go with a sheet rather than, yeah, rather than wall, wall labels. Can I just play here? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sure. This is an image, um, and it was an image I pulled off of uh, Google. Um, so this is so the, the, sh the show that this was in um, was a traveling exhibition that went from the Netherlands to a few other places, and um, it was an exhibition of single objects by a dozen artists, and they published a catalog. And the catalog was conceived as an extension of the exhibition, not documentation of it. So. Um, each artist was also invited to include one image in the catalog that was not an image of the work. So you were able to select something that either related or not. So for me, um, the piece that sort of rang true was um, this one, which is the US, you can see read it, but the US Pacific Fleet during a training exercise, um, you know, really sort of from the point, like the vantage point of the vanquished, from the receiving end of that. You know, we always see sort of the other end of it, but this is sort of from the, 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 the sort of the brunt of it. Um, and it was an image that I just downloaded off of the internet. It was a US government image, so I was able to uh, grab it without any worries of copyright or anything else. But yeah, it was uh, not doctored at all. It's frightening, isn't it? I mean, to me, it's horrifying, but sort of this thing goes out to other places to defend us. And that is an interesting prospect to me. Um, yeah, so this was in the publication that was associated with the work. I'll give you a couple more examples. Um, sorry, this is running a little slow. Uh, some other strategies. This is a body of work that I did uh, for a show. I work with a gallery in Miami. So this is an ongoing uh, series of work. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just show you the individual images. Uh, these are called shuffle paintings. Again, going back to that shuffle feature on my iPad. On my iPod. Uh, these are paintings that are, um, again, conceptual in nature, uh, strategy-based. Um, basically, I wanted to do a body of work that was related to the aesthetics of randomness. Um, I'm not the first person that's done random-based work. Um, I think I'm the first painter that's done it. Um, Randomness has always been around. Kurt Schwitters did it. John Cage was interested in it. Morley in France did it. Um, and I'm sure I'm not going to be the last person to do random-based aesthetic work. But what I wanted to do was um, sort of create a situation within a painting that um, enabled me to select things at random. So um, the premise of this is I made a suite of works. They're all about this big. So they're the size of me. They're not massive sort of monumental things. They're much more sort of scale to ideas than anything else. Um, I know I wanted a grid. Uh, a grid is a found thing. I didn't invent the grid. You know, the city here is built on a grid. I mean, the grids are everywhere. Um, I like the fact that I didn't invent it. I also didn't invent the idea of a checkerboard or sort of a checker pattern. Again, it's another given, um, all of which I like. Um, the decision I made in this was to do a four over four grid which seemed to enable four colors to mix with each other in every way possible um, on, e on all sides. A uh, five over five grid would have been very decorative. It would have allowed for more visual stimulation. And I'm kind of, well, you'll see with the work, um, visual stimulation is only part of it. Um, and three over three would have been, um, it wouldn't have allowed for true color interaction. So I went with a four by four grid. Um, how many of you guys go to like, when you go to the art supply store, you're like pulling out materials that you like, that you respond to? Yeah, I mean, for you artists that are there, painters, I'm sure, yes. Um, so as painters, we tend to go to the art supply store and 
look at sort of the library of colors that are available to you and say, wow, I really like this cadmium red or this, you know, diaxazane purple really resonates with me. I'm going to pull it and use it in my work because it somehow resonates with me in some way, shape, or form. I do that. Um, but for this body of work, I had to go beyond that. And I actually um, wanted to do a, a body of work that was about random color generation. So the way I did it was I identified one art supplier, Golden Paints. You guys may have hold, heard of them. I know them pretty well. I know Mark Golden. I like that company uh, quite a bit. Um, they're green. They're employee-owned. They're cool. They're really cool. And they're local. They're in New York State, so I'm always like local, like carbon footprint. Um, but I went to Golden and I, and I bought the entire library of colors that they produce. Um, there's like a hundred of them, like 110. All the colors. All the colors that I liked, all the colors that I was totally indifferent to, indifferent to and all the colors that um, uh, were kind of awful, um, like really awful. And I did a really old school kind of method and I painted an index card with each color. You know, just really old school that I labeled, whatever. Red oxide, burnt umber, silver, iridescent, fluorescent yellow, whatever it was. And I turned those hundred cards over and I shuffled them up like a deck of cards. Okay. And then I pulled out four cards, organized them by light and dark value onto a grid and made that painting. And I did it over and over and over and over and over again. Um, in this case, sort of very straight up and they became slightly more elaborate as I went along. Um, but what I was interested in here is, um, not so much, well, on one end, the, how these paintings were made, but I've had the opportunity to actually exhibit these paintings quite a bit. And I often paint, well, I always paint uh, the walls that they're exhibited on random color as well. So in some cases, it's been um, sort of 50% value gray. In some cases, it's been fluorescent yellow. In some cases, it's been bubblegum pink. Um, the wall being the context for that work. So getting away from a convention of a white wall. Like, why do we show work on white walls? Um, at all. So um, that's part of it. The other part of it that I really was interested in seeing is that um, was really a, sort of a question of people's taste. You know, and I've been showing these in enough places at this point in time with enough kinds of people in different contexts. And I always get asked a question sort of like, um, or I'll hear a comment like, this one of these five is like, this one's my favorite, right? Great. Or, you know, in my show in Miami, I had one of the gallery clients come up to me who was going to buy a painting, and they're like, we like these two paintings, which one is your favorite? And that is a really interesting question to me, like, which one is your favorite? And I sort of said, well, you, do you understand how I made these works, right? It's really trying to remove myself from the process of the aesthetic decisions in this painting as much as humanly possible, and I walked them through. Needless to say, I didn't sell the work, because they felt like they had been sort of duped in a way, like in a weird sort of thing that had happened, that it was more than meets the eye in a way. Um, and I find that construct very, very interesting. Like who likes which work and why? It's because it becomes a question of taste and conversation and ideas. And these are the things that I'm interested in sort of eliciting in these works. Um, so for this show, I did a number of works. Um, I can show you some examples. You can probably see this is like a I think gold and purple in it, gray, you know, I just literally did whatever came out. I uh, thought about, well, why am I bothering using the four colors? I'll just use one. So this is a yellow one. Um, I started doing uh, hues, sort of like three, or rather four oranges, four yellows, four green, greens, four purples, thinking, okay, so this is an option. Again, I'm interested in looking at my options. And then I thought, well, why don't I make a compound painting? and make a painting uh, with an exact replica of itself within it. Um, so this is what that looks like. So the colors go orange, green, orange, green, obviously. And they also go orange, green, orange, green in the small mini shuffle. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So why don't I do that again, but like reverse the color positions, like invert them. So they're actually not in the same location. They're actually kind of 180 degrees opposite of that. Or why don't I make a painting um, with another shuffle painting within that painting and hang the two of them side by side? And what does that mean? To hang a painting with a portrait of itself next to it. Um, and how would that function in terms of context? Uh, what about putting two of these in, in one painting and inverting the, the, the locations? Or two that are totally unrelated to it? Or scaling in other directions? So again, there's a million ways to do it. Or just blowing it out as far as it can possibly go within this context. Um, 
And then when they go up on the walls, they tend to look like, um, say, this. So does it matter where I place the work on the wall anymore? Does that make a difference in terms of how the work is viewed? Um, what about if I hang two paintings side by side? What does that context mean? And how does that change the meaning of this? Or the visual aesthetic of this? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I don't have any of these works on view in the show. Um, but I know they were reproduced in sort of the press material, so I thought it was important to talk about it a bit. Uh, oh. I'll show you one more example, and then I'll wrap up. Are there any questions so far? Anything at all? Uh, maybe I'll show you. Maybe this one. This is sort of a tough one. Um, and you're not going to see very much. Um, so uh, again, the idea of a white monochrome. Um, so what you're seeing here is a sheet of foam stickers um, that has been framed. And within the foam stickers, there are images of sort of crucifixes and Jesus fish and love signs and all sorts of other stuff. Um, this was a ready-made that I picked up at a sort of, I work with a gallery in Houston and sort of directly across the street, kind of catty corner, there's a Christian kind of novelty shop, Christian goods, which is like great for finding information, materials, aesthetics, like trying to get out of my own head. So uh, this was a white sheet of stickers um, with all sorts of religious symbols um, that made sense to me, but maybe not so much to other people. Um, and I framed it and um, sort of did a spin on, are you guys familiar with Malevich's work? Malevich, you've heard of him. So he, for those of you that haven't, he is uh, Russian. Uh, he was active um, in Russia during the late 1800s up to about 1930. And he's uh, credited with creating the first white monochrome painting. So like the white, it's basically not monochromatic at all, but at the time, I mean, it was outrageous. Um, it's at MoMA. I've seen it 100 million times at the Museum of Modern Art. It's like one of my favorite things ever. I sort of go there to kind of commune with it. Um, he was part of a sort of group of artists that were called um, suprematists, right? Um, and um, sort of thinking about sort of flips of language and Malevich and language and iconography and religious painting and sort of very sort of religious conservatism, which was very present in the White House at the time. Again, I'm not trying to offend anyone in any here. Um, I sort of dubbed this sort of a white supremacist composition, not a white suprematist. So it's a hark back to both Mondrian and to current politics and to sort of challenges in this country, um, all within this like little petite white thing. Um, which has traveled quite a bit um, through various sort of shows. Um, but again, sort of um, thinking through sort of ready-made spray paint, random hammering, um, blowing over, multiples, additions. Um, I'm interested in a lot of different things. Um, the thing that keeps me up at night um, in terms of my studio practice is being predictable um, and sort of doing um, doing work that I think I should make rather than think that um, the things that sort of compel me conceptually. Um, this is a, a work that has been, I mean, the kind of work that I'm interested in is uh, sort of a, again, sort of a sub-niche of the visual arts coming out of suprematism, geometric abstraction, um, geometric abstraction, um, cubism, I'm sort of running through the lineage in my head, concretism, um, constructivism through to minimalism, through to post-minimalism, through to neo-geo, through to today. And we've been sort of mucking around with this term called reductive abstraction, uh, which is a framework that we're using to describe this work. So this is work uh, that is involving a lot of different ideas and a lot of different strategies and sort of mashing them up in a way that hasn't been done before. Um, so yes, are there any questions? Yeah? Yeah? Um, you talked about your thoughts when you're developing a piece, but when it's on the wall, there's really no way that somebody can know what went through your brain to come to that piece mm -hmm. that removes you a bit in that part of the intent of your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's totally fine if you come to it with, um, with 
experience with the visual arts, if you know a little bit about art, if you know a little bit about culture, it's totally fine if you come to it completely raw. I think there's a lot of different ways you can respond to this. I mean, these are like pretty pattern paintings, you know, in some cases. Checkerboards, I think everybody understands. Grids, they understand color. I think the real challenge with making um, abstraction as a whole is um, sort of letting it sort of be present with you, you know, sort of letting it wash over you and taking it for what it is. Everyone wants to sort of like, well, what does this mean? What is this an abstraction of? Um, my kids could do this. You know, again, I hear like a lot of this. So as an abstract painter, you know, I'm often put in the position of sort of a defensive one, like having to defend this, having to defend this. So I feel it's better to over explain it in some cases than to just let it be. But I think um, if you, what I would recommend, I mean, in the case of the work that you're going to see is just, just look. There's no novelty, there's no gimmicks, there's no games. Just look. And like, what does it look like? And what does it look like in terms of things that you've seen before? Um, what frames of reference? What's the title infer? What does that mean to you? Are these um, materials that are commonly available? Are they um, manufactured specifically for the work? Are they materials that are being used as themselves? Are they being transformed in some way? Uh, what's the scale of the work? Is it petite? Is it ginormous? What format is it in? Is it, um, is it a grid? Is it uh, hung high on the wall? Is it low? Um, but thinking through all of these things, just um, I often, you know, because I run a gallery um, in Brooklyn, and I see a lot of audience actually coming in that specialize in the gallery that I run specializes in this kind of work on the global level. Um, all generations, all media. Um, and I often see people kind of come in and just sort of like do this whirlwind and then like walk right out. Um, because it's really clear to me that they're just not looking. I mean, they've spent more time kind of selecting what they're wearing for the day than actually looking at the work. And that's very frustrating to me. You know, so I would say sit, let it wash over you, spend some time with it. Not just my work, but any work, especially abstract work, though. And just sort of let it, sort of let the two of you kind of come into kind of common frequency with one another. And you can't do that by walking in and walking out. It doesn't work with any artwork, let alone abstraction. You kind of have to sit with it and let it kind of get into your bones. I don't know. Much better answer than question. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but I'm an advocate for abstraction. Um, I like everything, though. I'm not um, against anything. In fact, you know, I've done a degree in art history, so I'm pretty partial to everything. Uh, but it has to be good. That's my only criteria. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I think I haven't used it specifically, but it's definitely on the table. Absolutely. I've used my body uh, before. I don't have images, I don't think, up. But I did, uh, I've done performance work. Where is it? I did a, a project in Brussels, Belgium a few years ago that um, was a performance with my wife, who's also an artist. And we ran around this park in Brussels in a pattern where we were wearing um, monochromatic clothing and then ended the performance where we kissed each other. And this was actually taken by a tourist that was passing by. It was not meant to be seen, this performance. So yeah, I've used my body quite a bit. And I actually use my body a lot when I break those panels. I mean, I, there are my hands are, and this is part of that process where my hands are full of like blisters after it. I mean, because it's such a forceful thing to demolish a piece of plywood. Um, but no, I've never sort of done finger painting. My wife has, though, actually. Yeah. But anything is on the table, like an application, any kind of paint, any kind of application, any kind of strategy, anything that functions like paint, it's all on the table. I think um, in your work, I do up here, and I have comments on some of your exhibits, but all of your, which I just should say this, I guess I could say, all of your lines are very rigid. I don't know whether that's a good word or not. Hard edge, very, yeah. It just depends on the project. Yeah. Um, so if there's a conceit or an idea that I have in mind for a project that I want to do, and fingers were the way to do it, I would do it. I'm not. I, w I wouldn't. You know, have any have any question about that. Um, most of my work, actually, um, 
you know, I spend most of my time editing, just like pairing, 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 pairing down to where it's like absolutely distilled down to the most simple things possible. Um, I said it before in one of the classes, but um, you've all heard this quote that less is more. You know, this is an architecture quote. I don't know if you agree with this or not. You've heard of this, right? Yes, less is more? Okay. I think less is harder as well. Less is a lot harder. Um, and, you know, I think that there's virtue in that. Um, yes, there was a question. Really from my own practice. Yeah, anything's on the table from my own practice, but I'm totally fine with showing artists in my space who have restricted their own practices in a certain way or have defined it in a certain way. Like I only make oil paintings or I only do um, red paintings or I only do, you know, abstract animation. or I mean, it just depends on the work. Um, but yeah, I take it at a face value. It just um, needs to be as specific unto itself um, for what it's supposed to do. So it has to be very intentional. And it has to be deliberate. Um, yeah, I guess I'm less patient with the other stuff. That's that's sort of more fluid. Yeah. What are you reading lately? It's a really good question. I've been reading. Jeez, um, I read the internet incessantly. Like anything that has to do with the news. Um, I've been reading. Oh God, what was the last thing I read? Probably Steve Jobs' biography was the last thing I read. Um, and the part that I like the most about that, about Steve Jobs, again, I read all sorts of things. It's mainly nonfiction. I never read fiction. I hardly ever read poetry, although I'm interested in the idea of poetry. Um, uh, but what I liked about his biography the most is there was this story, and you probably have heard it already, where you know they were developing, I don't know, it was the new iPhone or the iPad or it was some piece of technology. And it was like, you know, it was stunningly designed. I mean, this minimalism design has been co-opted from visual arts. I'm sorry. All of this has been co-opted. So this um, design, gorgeous on the outside. So there's a story where he's meeting with his engineers, and he's looking at what this thing looks like on the inside, which is a mess. And he was just like, wasn't having it. So they had to go back and re-engineer what it looked like on the inside so that he knew that it was precisely and pristinely made. And that resonated with me exactly. I mean, that was super important to me because I feel the exact same way. Like if the screws that are hanging in the back of a painting are not correct, even though you'll never see them, it just will drag me up a wall. Yeah. Yeah. It's not anal retentiveness. It's something else. It's like being very meticulous about things. Deliberate about things. Yeah. Other questions, guys? Do you think I'm removed from it? Well, no, I mean, you said, like, yeah. you are with other people in your sessions sometimes, and you are with what they do, and um, picking random cards out of the set. Right. Stuff like that. I think it's, it's a good question. So there's, um, I think there's a tendency in painting, particularly, but in other visual arts fields as well, to kind of define sort of signature territory. You know, either a signature way of working with paint, for instance, or a signature subject matter. Um, and I like that convention, but I'm also interested in sort of undermining that a bit, too. Um, I guess I would hope that you would see that there is a common thread in all of this work, particularly in the stuff that's in the gallery right now, which you're going to see firsthand, um, that there is a, a, a sort of a common mind that makes that kind of work, but not necessarily a common look um, that puts it all together. So it's sort of like thinking it through conceptually, not so much visually. So the work that I'm known for and the stuff that I've now been showing, which I'm very fortunate to be showing quite a bit, is known for this kind of strategy. And in some cases, people want to show this aspect of it or that aspect of it or the other aspect of it because it fits some premise of a show that they're working on. But um, they know what they're getting, you know, and they don't, and in Ruth's case, it's total faith, you know, like Ruth <coughs> knows the way my mind operates, you know, so she invited me to do a show here not knowing what I was going to make. Um, it's a super way to describe it is that um, when you know someone's a good cook, you don't worry about what they're making for dinner, you know? So it's like you, you know, 
you trust the, you trust the cook, and I'm more interested in being known as a cook than, you know, a preparer of spaghetti. You know, I don't know if that's a good analogy. Maybe I lost you on that one. Yeah, like having a killer spaghetti recipe. You know. Um, other questions? Nothing. Is anyone confounded by this, or want to refute it, or disagree with it? I'm much more interested in that than like talking at you. No. Nobody. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate uh, your interest and your questions and for having me here. Um, I am totally available to talk about the works that are in the show that you're going to see, which I think you'll be sort of now primed for, I guess, is a good way to describe it. But thank you so much. And I'm here all week. So if there's questions that come up at any point in time, just let me know.